Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for asking me to speak once again at your conference. Self-care is a vitally important uh, subject, and it is one that, as, as I'm sure I don't need to say, is critical for the NHS and its longevity. Um, it's a particular pleasure for me to open uh, today's event with my friend and colleague from the House of Lords, um, Philip Hunt, who will be um, joining me on the platform, uh, and a pleasure too to uh, launch the theme of this year's Self-Care Week, um, Self-Care for Life, Be Healthy This Winter. And that theme uh, suggests, that something, su suggests something we already know uh, very well, that the weather plays an important part in our state of health. So doing what we can to prevent and manage weather-related uh, illness is an important aspect of what we mean when we talk about self-care. But self-care also spans the everyday things that we do when we are well, such as washing our hands or uh, eating healthily, right through to managing our health when we're unwell uh, and have chronic or long-term conditions such as diabetes or coronary heart disease. My key message today is going further on self-care is absolutely vital for the sustainability of the NHS and it is also better for patients. And to make this happen, we need there to be a more systematic shift in the relationship between patient and clinician so that we achieve a genuine two-way partnership where patients are active participants uh, in their own health. Giving patients more power in the NHS involves a concerted effort at every level, national, regional and, and local, and perhaps most importantly of all, in the consulting room, uh, in the one-to-one -one conversations between clinician and patient. If people are more involved in their health and care, they are in a much stronger position to manage their own health care, and we know that this results in improved patient outcomes, fewer unnecessary consultations, better patient experience, and of course better use of resources. Working with our system and third sector partners, the Department of Health is absolutely committed to putting patients at the heart of the NHS in a genuine sense, giving them information, tools, support, and of course care to help them get well and stay well. This is the 16th year of this conference, so I don't need to point to any of you uh, about, that, uh, about the self-care agenda. It's not a new agenda. A lot has already happened maybe not as fast as we would like, as the video pointed out. But it is as important as ever to get this right and build on what has been achieved, and we shouldn't belittle what has been achieved. Uh, and this is recognised right at the top of the NHS. Sir Bruce Keogh, the NHS Medical Director, in his review of urgent and emergency care uh, last year, proposed that the NHS should provide better and more easily accessible information about self-treatment options so that people who prefer to can avoid the need to see a healthcare professional. And NHS England's Forward View, uh, published a few days ago, also reminded us that there are compelling health and economic reasons for doing this. There's good evidence that shows that there is an appetite amongst the public to play more of a role in their health and care if they are supported to, to do that. For example, <coughs> in one study, 76% of people with long-term conditions thought that they would be or could be far more confident about caring for their own health with support from health professionals. And 66% said that they could be more confident with the support of people 
with the same conditions or concerns as, as they had. There are lots of good examples of initiatives that encourage people to adopt better lifestyles and empower them to make decisions about their own care and management. A whole body of work is being driven by NHS England and Public Health England in exactly this area. For example, Everybody Active Every Day, which is an evidence-based approach to improve uh, all our health through just everyday activity. S the Stoptober, which, uh, as you know, is one of the nation's biggest social marketing approaches to encourage people to quit smoking. There's the development of personalised care and support planning for patients with long-term conditions, including, uh, quite importantly, um, incentives for GPs to uh, support personalised care planning in the most complex cases. There are personal health budgets, which are currently available uh, to people with continuing health care needs. There's a huge amount of work to promote accessible information, including a new statutory standard for accessibility of information to patients and the public. And there are patient decision aids and other tools to support patients to make better informed choices over care and treatment options. So these sorts of initiatives are the foundations of lasting change and are thoroughly good. But to make self-care a reality demands a shift in culture. In order for people to self-care more, they of course need the information to do that. People know, need to know how to lead a healthy lifestyle, how to recognise symptoms, symptoms of, of illness and how to manage them. But, um, and to do that, they need the provision of high quality and accessible health information. There has been a surge in the range of health information that's available to people and the way in which information is shared. Paper-based fact sheets and leaflets, messages on buses, uh, and more recently, of course, digital resources such as NHS Choices. NHS Choices is uh, evolving in quite a wonderful way, I think, to give people tools to make more informed choices about their health and well-being. My NHS, for example, shows the data used by the NHS and local councils to monitor performance and shape the services that, that people <coughs> use. And NHS Choices includes a health apps library spanning the whole range of lifestyle and clinical conditions to help people choose the apps that are safe and easy to use. And the, for example, there's the uh, NHS Symptom Checker, which gives someone advice on the best course of action. Uh, and if they can look after themselves at home, uh, it advises them how to do that. Uh, there's an app called Moodscope, which enables users to measure and track their mood every day so that they're able to learn what causes their, their ups and downs. And there's Hearts and Minds, which calculates your risk of having uh, a heart attack or a stroke uh, and to find out what's available to enable you to improve things for yourself. These are just a few examples uh, among many. Technology and digital services have a hugely important contribution to make to the self-care agenda. But there's a lot more that can be done to raise awareness of the availability and application of health technologies. A recent study suggests that over half of people do not know what health technologies are, and 43% said they'd prefer to go to their doctor. That, I think, is a stark reminder of how we continue to see GPs as our first port of call, even when there are other good options available. However, to, in order to do more on self-care and make effective use of technologies, 
patients not only need to have the knowledge to recognize symptoms and understand health conditions and so on and so forth, they need the confidence and the skills to manage their conditions. Evidence suggests that between 20 and 40 percent of the population simply do not have those skills or that confidence. There's a growing agenda internationally about what is called patient activation and the value of the patient activation measure, the PAM, as a measure of how involved people actually are in, in managing their health. Patients with higher levels of activation have been shown to be more engaged in um, preventative uh, behaviour, health promoting, um, self-management, uh, information seeking behaviours. And there's also evidence that higher activation scores are associated with lower utilisation of services and, crucially, better outcomes. Many of the behaviours that we're asking of people are only pursued by those with the highest levels of activation. Those with the lowest levels of motivation have the most to gain from being moved, uh, as it were, up the scale. And these are the people who can have the biggest impact on the use of health services. There is potential for increasing levels of patient activation to deliver a reduction in healthcare costs in the region of 4.65 billion pounds. That is the figure that I have that has been researched um, independently. 4.65 billion. NHS England is working with uh, the uh, Health Foundation and the King's Fund on a two-year pilot to measure the, the PAM, patient activation measure, in five CCGs and the renal registry. And there is certainly value, I think, in considering a wider application. There's a way to go. Over a third of people with long-term conditions say that they have never been encouraged to self-care by health professionals, with no difference between those who felt their health was fair or poor compared to, to the average. So that indicates that there is a gulf between appetite and opportunity to support self-care. The same is true of people with minor ailments. While people are usually able to manage uh, without ever seeing a doctor, once they do, they tend to continue that behaviour. We know that approximately 50 million visits to, to the GP are made for minor ailments such as coughs and colds. And in many of these cases, people might have saved themselves the time and the trouble of booking and waiting for a GP appointment if only they had recognised and understood common symptoms, known how to treat them, had been aware of other services such as pharmacies, uh, and if GPs had told them that this is what they expected them to do first. An increasing number of pharmacies are becoming healthy living pharmacies. Healthy living pharmacies, as I'm sure most of you know, aim to work with local people to improve their health and well-being and help to reduce health inequalities by delivering quite a broad range of high-quality public health services. So they have, a, in my view, a key role to play in supporting self-care. So patients need to be encouraged to self-care more so that they believe that this is something that they're confident in doing. And that requires not only accessible information, but <coughs> collaborative conversations between the patient and the health professional to discuss treatment options. In fact, there is evidence to suggest that when patients are fully informed, they don't always choose the most in invasive interventions, which are the ones that, that tend to be more, more costly. And it isn't just patients 
who need support if the patient-doctor-dependent culture uh, is to change more. We mustn't forget the importance of supporting the workforce who are doing a fantastic job uh, and already involving their patients in their care. Medical, edu med medical education and clinical training needs to be in place. In other words, by empowering health professionals, we can empower patients. The NICE standard on patient experience defines what is best practice in this area. It provides evidence-based statements for commissioners to support a cultural shift towards a truly patient-centred service. In June, National Voices launched a set of resources to help commissioners and providers to understand and make best use of the best evidence for various approaches in, in, to involving people in their health and, and, and care. And many of you will already be aware that because the evidence shows that involving patients in their care is, is a successful approach, the Royal College of GPs have developed a free online learning module on self-care for minor ailments, which is aimed at developing GP and nurse consultation skills to support self-care for patients. And I do think that that's an absolutely key ingredient in, in this whole equation. Now, it's apt that the theme of this year's Self-Care Week, which will run from the 17th to the 23rd of November, uh, is all about preparing people for winter. And that will build on last year's uh, Self-Care Week and successful campaign where winter pressures was an emerging theme and that was something that I focused on in my speech then. We know that certain parts of the NHS are under pressure because of unprecedented demand. Demand that is linked to the challenges of our ageing population. Despite this, the NHS is performing well and it is treating the vast majority of people quickly. Every year, the health system, and particularly A&E, face uh, significant challenges in the colder winter months. This year, the health and care system started planning for winter much, much earlier than ever before. We are better prepared than ever uh, this winter, thanks to extra support for more operations, more doctors, nurses, and beds. And we're also helping to protect the public by vaccinating uh, vulnerable groups for flu and making sure everyone knows which services to use if they do become poorly. Ultimately, we want to reduce the pressure on services by reforming the urgent care system, caring for people better in the community. And I think that is an aim that's shared across uh, the spectrum. But one thing's important for me to emphasize. Self-care is not an agenda that is driven solely for, uh, by reason of cost pressures. It is something that patients tell us that they want, uh, and it is therefore the right thing to do. The Self-Care Forums campaign will, I'm absolutely sure, be a powerful addition to the activities that I've mentioned, providing uh, patient-facing organisations with a range of materials, leaflets, posters, social media messages, to use the campaign to increase people's opportunity uh, of, to self-care. And, and as well as improving people's understanding and awareness of winter ailments and what they should do, in turn, that will help to promote better use of NHS resources by signposting people to the right services uh, first time around for their particular health needs. I hope and believe we can be optimistic. The success of last year's campaign is a good barometer of how self-care is progressively gaining widespread support from healthcare professionals uh, and from NHS organisations. For all the hours that most people spend with their doctor or nurse, they spend thousands more looking after themselves uh, or, or someone they love. By working together, 
we can ensure that the NHS becomes dramatically better at involving people, empowering them to manage and make decisions about their own care and treatment so that far more people will continue to develop all the, the, the knowledge and the skills and confidence that I've been talking about to manage uh, their own health and thereby live their lives to the full. Society has been transformed exponentially uh, since the NHS was, was set up. There has been significant demographic change and, of course, rapid technological and digital advancement. The nature of illness has changed, along with the choices for treatment. Our friends and our families and wider community and networks have a significant uh, impact on how we live our lives, and they need to be a more critical part of the equation in how the NHS supports us to uh, adapt to live our, our lives in, in an optimal way. I'm so pleased to be here. Today's event uh, is one that um, is, is really important, as I've, as I've said, and I'd like to thank the Self Care Forum and the PABGB for inviting me to speak and for arranging the conference. This is a golden opportunity to share ideas, share solutions for going further on self-care, and I wish this conference and Self-Care Week every success. Thank you very much.